there's a prophecy amongst shaman, brujos, and sages. Evil is always waiting in the shadows, and only one man would rise to stand against it. A hero, a promised one, El Jefe. Fanboys and fangirls, I'm Erod and I'm the Blockbuster Buster. Finally, after 23 years of waiting, we got a continuation to the Evil Dead franchise. Was it worth the wait? Well, before we get to that, a fair warning. Evil Dead is not for everyone. This franchise is violent, gory, twisted, and unrelenting. It makes The Walking Dead look like Dora the Explorer. So if you can't handle unrated content, I suggest you turn back now. Because this franchise is hard to the core. You've been warned. Now, here's a little backstory for the benefit of the uninitiated. History of the Dead. The franchise started as an independent horror movie in 1981, following a bunch of dumb 20-somethings looking to have a fun, sexy weekend in a remote cabin in the woods, until they accidentally stumble upon the Necronomicon Ex Mortis, the Book of the Dead, bound in flesh, inked in blood, and possessing the power to summon all manner of unholy evil. Our hapless protagonists play a recording of the book being read, and all hell breaks loose as each of them is systematically possessed by the evil forces, and the movie becomes a hack-slash fight for survival, as the unpossessed are forced to kill their own friends in order to stay alive. The movie was an instant hit, mostly due to the controversy of its violent content, but also because the premise was so unique from all the horror movies that existed at the time. Its success was such that it efficiently launched the careers of director Sam Raimi, its producer Robert Tapper, and its star Bruce Campbell, and all three of them have remained a major force in the world of entertainment to this very day. Eventually, the three teamed with Dino De Laurentiis to produce a sequel, which would see Campbell's character, Ash Williams, go from hapless victim to boomstick shooting chainsaw handed demon killing action hero. Groovy. This, fanboys and fangirls, is when the franchise became a cult hit attracting legions of faithful fans who cemented Ash Williams as a pop culture icon. And thus, the never-ending adoration of the franchise and the success of Sam Raimi's Darkman prompted the original House of Horrors, Universal Studios, to greenlight a third installment, Army of Darkness, which would see Ash accidentally sent back in time where he battles the evil dead in the Middle Ages. While this film was well received by the fan base, it barely made a profit, marking what many believe the end of the Evil Dead saga. While the series did receive the occasional continuation in the form of comic books and video games, fans still clamored for a fourth movie. And in 2010, it seemed like we were going to get our wish, as rumors began to surface that a new Evil Dead movie was in the works. Unfortunately, this turned out to be a remake by Fetty Alvarez, which was fine, but it still lacked the heart and humor of the original movies, and more importantly, it lacked Ash. That's right, Ash Williams is not in the 2013 Evil Dead remake. Not to take anything away from Jane Levy, who was a kick-ass protagonist, but as an Evil Dead fan, I only hail to one king. Hail to the king, baby. Ironically, the remake only caused the desire for a proper Evil Dead continuation to intensify. So much so, that plans were put into motion to continue the saga as an unrated TV series on a premium channel. Which seemed like a very practical plan as Raimi, Tappert, and Campbell had found plenty of success producing syndicated TV shows, such as Hercules The Legendary Journeys and Xena Warrior Princess. So combining their TV experience with their most famous creation seemed like a no-brainer. So in 2015, it became official an ongoing Evil Dead series would premiere on the Stars Network on Halloween night. And this time they were putting Ash's name in the title to make it clear to everyone that this was not another Ashless remake. So, Ash has battled for his life in a remote log cabin and gone to war against the legions of evil in medieval times. So what was next for our favorite boomstick badass? The Plot The show picks up 30 years later, revealing that Ash has been doing very little with his life, avoiding responsibility, staying on the move, and keeping the book under lock and key. Until one night, when he gets high and stupidly reads the book aloud to impress a girl. Um, yeah, sometimes he's a bit of an idiot. 
The evil, of course, returns, but this time, as opposed to letting the book wreak havoc and trying to clean it up later, Ash starts to actively look for a way to destroy the book and vanish all the evil from our dimension. A new attitude that resulted out of the influence of Ash's new friends, Kelly and Pablo. So our clueless heroes go from place to place trying to find a way to destroy the book and vanquish the evil dead. Good to be back. How does it feel? Groovy. Cast and characters. First of all, hats off to all the actors who played the Deadites. They were an essential part of the franchise and all those performers were fantastic. What's up? Not only did this show have a lot of great guest stars, but it also had a lot of familiar faces from the creator's previous shows. And let's not forget about the classic, Sam Raimi's Delta 88, that makes it into every single one of his movies, from the original Evil Dead to this series. But ultimately, this show only had four main characters, so in this section, I'm gonna focus on them and cover the rest as I make my way through the seasons. Let's begin with Ash's greatest frenemy. Ruby, played by Lucy Lawless. In the time that Raimi, Tappert, and Campbell have worked together, they've never produced anything more successful than Xena Warrior Princess. Not to mention that the star of the show, Lucy Lawless, is married to Robert Tapper in real life. So it was a vital necessity to cast Lucy in this series. After all, if you're going to give an icon like Ash Williams an antagonist, it better be someone equally if not more iconic than Ash. And who better than Xena? <laughs> say one more dumb thing. I'm gonna say a lot of dumb things. Unfortunately, due to Lucy's rigorous schedule, her addition to the series came very late in the production, so the creators hadn't quite figured out her character right away, which made her ambiguous and hard to define, but kept the character interesting, as every season, Lucy would play her differently. Initially introduced as the daughter of Professor Nobi, the scholar who originally brought the book to the cabin where Ash and his friends found it. She blames Ash for the death of her parents and wants to get the book from Ash and set things right. Of course, there's a lot more to her than that, but we'll get to that as we go along. For now, all you need to know is that Ruby is a badass Deadite Slayer that gives Ash a run for his money. Ooh, Pablo. <laughs> Kelly Maxwell, played by Dana DiLorenzo. Kelly starts out as an apathetic, sarcastic value stop employee who loses her parents to the evil and joins Ash's crew simply to get revenge. Now, while she might be filthy and fine, she's filthy and fine. Filthy and fine. Filthy. And fine. Yeah, heard that one before. She is also the realist of the group, the voice of reason. Dare to counteract Pablo's naivete and Ash's stupidity. I wish I had my rusty chain, yo. No. Keep trying. Damn. Pablo Simon Bolivar, played by Ray Santiago. The courageous caballero with the Kramer cut, the Sancho Panza to Ash's Don Quixote. Pablo was already Ash's sidekick way before our hero negligently released the Evil Dead, always watching Ash's back and faithful to the last. And I don't know why, but there's just something about Ash having a Puerto Rican sidekick with goofy hair that I just find very appealing for some reason. Leave it to the Puerto Rican to like talk forever and take it over and make it emotional and cultural and all that good stuff. Pablo starts out as a cowardly naive nincompoop, but eventually evolves into an invaluable member of the team, proving that loyalty and friendship can cancel out fear. Oh yeah, I think I found my own boomstick. <laughs> Ashley J. Williams, played by Bruce Campbell. Why can I say it's my all-time favorite actor playing one of my all-time favorite characters? This is an embarrassment of riches. The brash, unruly boomstick badass was back, and he is better than ever. Some question why an irritable jackass like Ash can be such an effective hero? Well, according to Sam Raimi, the rule for writing Ash is simply that he is only good at two things, talking women into sleeping with him and killing monsters. Anything else, he's completely worthless. It's incredible to stop and think that after 20 years, Bruce Campbell is just as good at playing this character, if not better. Just be polite in there. Oh, I'll be polite. 
right up until I'm rude. Not only was Ash as surly and rude as in all of the past installments of the franchise, but as the series progressed, we got to see an unexpected, tragic, dramatic side to the character that we hadn't seen before. We see that he constantly repels others because everyone he cares about has been viciously taken away from him. Which brings me to why Ash, Kelly, and Pablo fit in so well with one another. They are all terribly flawed people, cowardly, apathetic, ignorant. But in whatever attribute they lack, the other two make up for it. Ash's courage, Pablo's heart, and Kelly's rational thinking. Working together perfectly in conjunction with one another, as they complete each other perfectly. Alone, they might be aimless shitty people, but together, they might just make a decent hero. And that's why I believe that it is not Ash who is the promised one, it's the three of them working together as one badass monster fighting machine, which Pablo enthusiastically named the Ghost Beaters. Hey, I was toying with a nickname for us. The Ghost Beaters. That is so fucking bad. Yeah, buddy, I gotta tell you, that's probably the worst thing I've ever heard. Hardcore gore. As I've stated before, the gore in this show is extremely graphic and a good 75% of the effect are fully practical, which I deeply, deeply appreciate. Hats off to the younger actors who were subjected to the largest amount of viscous fluids being fired into their faces, which is what the creators like to refer to as standard evil dead hazing. The point is the crew went through extremes to give us the most genuine evil dead effects that they could create, and that is awesome. Season one. Major props to stars for pulling out all the stops when advertising the show. Trailers, promos, panels, interviews, featurettes. It was impossible to be unaware of Evil Dead's return. Not to mention that the night that it premiered, they had an Evil Dead marathon, hosted by Bruce Campbell, which concluded with the pilot episode of Ash vs. Evil Dead. LFA. And not only were Bruce Campbell and Robert Tabard back as star and producer, but Sam Raimi took time out of his rigorous filmmaking schedule to direct the pilot. So we were getting the most legit Evil Dead reboot they could possibly give us. And it was glorious. For the longest time, El Jefe was my favorite episode, perfectly establishing the new characters while reintroducing the classic elements, blending horror, comedy, and action seamlessly, building up to an eclectic climax, seeing Ash do what he does best, making deadites dead. Mommy should have taught you to knock. In order for the show to maintain the same movie level of quality from week to week, cost-cutting methods had to be implemented. So the production was moved to New Zealand, where it's less costly to produce fantasy shows, and the creators already had plenty of experience producing Hercules and Xena there. Furthermore, stars only ordered 10 30-minute episodes per season. While this might seem rather minimalistic, the upside was that the content was uncut and commercial-free, which kept the pacing of each episode fluid and fast, as the writers never had to worry about writing in pauses for the commercial breaks. And that's the kind of compromise that I can live with. Like most inaugural seasons, this one was about laying down the groundwork for the rest of the series. Our characters are effectively established and developed as they move from place to place trying to find a way to destroy the book, with Ruby hot on their trail. This culminates where the saga started, The Cabin in the Woods. And I don't know about you, but I am blown away by the incredible job the production team did recreating one of the most iconic sets in film history. All right. We're about to delve into spoiler territory, so if you haven't seen Ash vs. Evil Dead, you might want to stop the video here. You've been warned. So our heroes converge at the cabin and there is immediate friction between Ash and Ruby. And this, fanboys and fangirls, is when this show wrote a check it did not cash, as it set up one of the greatest fanboy fantasy fights of all time, Ash vs. Xena. But sadly, it never happens. They just cock tease you with it. There is a chance it might have happened further down the line if the show hadn't been cancelled, but we'll never know. But they did give us one hell of a twist, as we find out that Ruby is not the daughter of Professor Nobi. She is in fact one of the dark ones that wrote the Necronomicon. I wrote this book. An immortal she-demon looking to control all the evil in our dimension. This was an awesome reveal because, as I stated before, Lucy is a perfect on-screen nemesis for Bruce. Unfortunately, their battle never happens. The true enjoyment of the season comes in the evolution of the characters, as Kelly goes from being a hapless victim to a demon-destroying dame. You're it. Ah! 
Pablo, of course, realizes that he has a larger destiny after witnessing the death of his uncle. But more on that later. The true surprise comes in the revelation that the violent and vulgar Ash Williams actually cares, because now that he has people to look after, he actually has a cause to fight for. Which leads me to the final confrontation. We get a full old school Evil Dead Cabin in the Woods treatment. Horror, gore, action with just a little bit of mindfuckery. Dumb 20-somethings die, Ash fights himself, business as usual. In the end, Ruby gains possession of the book, turns Pablo into a baby demon incubator, and is about to kill Kelly. And thus, we begin the show's trend of Ash making stupid decisions in order to save his friends. Instead of an epic battle with the she-demon, Ash calls a truce. Ruby gets to manage the evil in the world, and Ash, Kelly, and Pablo will stay out of her way and retire to Jacksonville. I found this ending to be a bit vexing. I would have liked to have seen a little bit more action, and I will admit it was a little bit anticlimactic. However, it was fitting, as Ash wanted nothing to do with fighting the evil. He only got involved to keep Pablo and Kelly safe, so when he got a guarantee from Ruby that they would be protected, Ash took the deal without thinking twice. So yes, it sucks that the promised one took the easy way out, but it makes sense. Plus, Stars had picked up season 2 before the first one even aired, so you knew there was more story to come. So in spite of the underwhelming nature of the climax, I accepted it. Season 2 The second season picks up a few weeks later. Ruby was trying to manage the evil using her Hellspawn as enforcers, but somehow loses control of them. They turn against her, take her immortality, and start hunting for the book. Ruby has no choice but to summon Ash to clean up her mess. Meanwhile, our hero is doing what he does best. <laughs> Partying like a motherfucker. Also, he opened a keg of beer with his chainsaw. That is the most ash thing Bruce Campbell has ever done. While our hero is loving life, the sidekicks are tending bar. Until the truce with the evil dead is unexpectedly broken. And to make matters worse, not only do the ghost beaters have to get back in the fray, but they have to go back to Ash's hometown of Elk Grove, where everyone thinks that Ash is a crazy serial killer who murdered his friends in the cabin during the events of the first movie. This becomes an added degree of difficulty for our heroes, as they not only have to deal with the deadites and the hellspawn, but dumb rednecks who think Ash is a psychopath. But on the upside, of this, now Ruby joins Ash's side. I need your help. Oh, oh, you need my help. Okay, first of all, screw you and your ugly ass kids. Here's what I need. I need to be back in Jacksonville on my second keg of beer, putting my spicy man meat into a mother-daughter sandwich. That's what I need. And we got some kick-ass additions to the cast in the form of Ash's best friend, Chet Kaminsky, played by Ted Raimi from Xeno Warrior Princess, and none other than the six million dollar man himself, Lee Majors, as Brock Williams, Ash's dad. This is the greatest casting choice since Kurt Russell was casted as Star-Lord's dad in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Also, just for this season, Ash got a love interest in the form of Linda Bates, played by Michelle Hurd. I like Michelle. She is a great actor with great comedic timing, but her chemistry with Bruce just wasn't that good. I wish they would have gotten someone who had already proven to have a good on-screen connection with Bruce, like Angela Dutchin, Gina Torres, or my personal favorite of Bruce's love interest, Kelly Rutherford from The Adventures of Briscoe County Jr. Hi, you're a... your dress has caught my fly. Oh. I'll get that for you. Oh, no, 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 it's okay, I, I got it. Ash and Linda's relationship felt pretty forced and unnecessary, and as much as I hate to admit it, Linda ultimately was nothing more than a fry, a forced romantic interest. So when she was absent in the third season with little to no explanation, I didn't shed a tear. However, the most valuable addition to the cast this season came in the form of the big bad, Ball played by none other than Joel Tobek, best known as Strife and Deimos in both Hercules and Xena. Apparently, the reason Ruby's spawn turned on her is because they were willed to do so by their father, Ball, who wants his kids to steal the Necronomicon and summon him back to Earth. Ball is beyond the shadow of a doubt the best villain in the series. While he possesses the usual demon powers, strength, invulnerability, etc., he smoothly achieves most of his goals by influencing others into doing his bidding. Plus, he has the added ability of being able to jump into the bodies of his victims and disguise himself, which means that anyone could be Ball, which creates an excellent air of paranoia among our heroes. Ultimately, Ball's plan is to discredit Ash and mentally torture him until Ash 
willingly relinquishes the Necronomicon to him. Eventually, Ball's devious scheme leads to my favorite episode in the entire series, Delusion, where Ball traps Ash in an insane asylum and attempts to convince him that he is crazy, that he truly did murder his friends in that cabin 30 years ago, and his adventures as the promised one were just all in his head. Now, this premise is nothing new. We've seen it before, in the Buffy episode Normal Again, and the TNG episode Frame of Mind. What makes this episode unique is that it's a battle of wills between Ash and Ball. Can the villain break Ash and make our hero part of his plan, or can Ash hold on long enough for his friends to find him and save him? Not to mention that Bruce Campbell's performance in this episode is excellent. I'm not surprised at all that he won a Saturn Award for the portrayal of Ash Williams in this show, cause he truly, truly deserves it. And did I mention that this episode introduces the best piece of merch in the history of the franchise? Okay, I've seen some seriously disturbing stuff recently, but you are adorable. In true Ash fashion, our hero turns the tables on Ball last minute. Pablo uses his brujo skills to vanish Ball from our dimension, but there was just one little glitch in their plan. <laughs> That's right, Ball kills Pablo. So once again, Ash makes a shit decision to save his friend. This time, he travels back in time to prevent himself from ever finding the Necronomicon. And thus, we arrive at my one and only big issue with this season. Earlier, we meet a hobo that claims that Ash ruined his life. And then, we find out exactly what he meant when our hero travels back in time. We see Ash hand the future hobo a bottle of booze effectively ruining his life. Now, this effectively establishes the cause and effect rule, meaning that no matter what they do in the past, the events of the future remain the same. In other words, there is no changing the future. But they almost immediately violate this rule by having Ash regain his right hand the moment they steal the book from the cabin. So they can change the future? Ugh. Look, I know that I shouldn't obsess over logistics in a show that includes a demonic colon and a sperm battle, but I still found this inconsistency to be pretty damn distracting. Other than that, the climax of the season is pretty damn awesome. At first, I was a bit disappointed that once again, the season ended with our heroes going back to the cabin. I mean, how many times were they going to go back to that damn cabin? But like I said, the conclusion is solid. So I got over it pretty quickly. So the whole thing turns out to be an elaborate ploy by Ball, who was hiding inside Pablo's corpse all along. He effectively tricked Ash into taking him back in time, where he could both get the book and reshape history to his liking. He also summons the original immortal Ruby to help him, which makes matters even more complicated. Whoa. Who are you? I'm you. From another time. With the bad guys holding all the cards, Ash appeals to Ball's ego and challenges the demon to a good old fashioned fist fight without the use of his powers. If Ash wins, he gets Pablo back and Ball and Ruby are vanished from our dimension. If Ball wins, he kills the promised one and gets to do whatever he wants with Kelly. Me to be banished and you to be defiled and devoured. I never heard anything about being defiled. It was implied, trust me. This, my friends, is the epic fight scene that should have been at the end of the show. Which, of course, Ash wins with a bit of mild trickery. Thus, they get Pablo back and somehow, some way, manage to not alter the events of the future, even though they completely destroyed the cabin. As much as I love the climax of the season, the epilogue that followed just didn't sit right with me. Where we see that the town of Elk Grove apologizes to Ash for believing that he was a murderer, and they even honor him. The ongoing message of the franchise is that being a hero is pretty much a thankless task, and Ash truly never gets what he wants. So Ash and his crew getting a nice happy ending just didn't feel right at all. The saving grace of this scene is that we learned that during Ash and Ball's battle, Ruby altered the deal so she would be exempt from being vanished from our dimension. Which means that the Ghost Beaters time travel shenanigans inadvertently brought back the evil Ruby from season one. Season three. In the months following the events of the previous season, Evil Ruby has been hunting for the Necronomicon, and Ash is doing what he does best. For 30 long years, I've used this saw on monsters and demons. But those battles are won. So now I use it to... Slash prices! Selling out like a motherfucker. Oh yeah, Ash is retired and Kelly is tending bar and... Wait, 
That's exactly the way the previous season started. <sighs> okay, whatever. As far as Evil Ruby is concerned, instead of trying to defeat the Promised One, she plans to replace him by giving birth to a duplicate Ash that she created by using black magic. Because as it turns out, if something happens to Ash, the next person in his bloodline would become the new Promised One. And he who controls both the Necronomicon and the Promised One controls all. But there's just one little itty bitty little problem with her plan. If something were to happen to Ash, his evil counter part wouldn't be the next in his bloodline. That would be his illegitimate daughter Brandy, played by Ariel Carver O'Neill. Yeah, Ash is a daddy. How was I supposed to know that all that crazy sex could lead to a kid? This is by far one of the most enjoyable aspects of the season. Ash trying to be a good dad is like Gordon Ramsay trying to be a grief counselor. On our wedding night, we were going at it in the back seat when all of that Kentucky glory started to catch up on her. But after she sicked up on the front dash, and I mean all over the front dash, she was ready for round two. Let me tell you, not a lot of ladies have that kind of... As far as Brandy goes, it took me a long time to warm up to her. She spends most of the season being a whiny nag, just cramping everyone's style. I didn't truly start to like her until the penultimate episode, Judgment Day, when Ariel was given the difficult task of recreating a lot of Ash's signature moments from the movies, and she met every challenge with frightful accuracy. It was in this episode when I finally understood why this girl was chosen to play Ash Williams' daughter, because there truly wasn't anyone better. It was an absolute delight to see her and Ash slaying Deadites together, and it's a damn shame that the show ended before we got a chance to see more. Now let's talk about the rest of the Ghost Beaters, because this is the season where we see the most dramatic changes in these characters. After Ash retires, Kelly keeps fighting evil on her own and even starts working with the Knights of Samaria, an ancient group that has been preparing to fight the evil since Ash fought the Army of Darkness in medieval times. I wish there would have been a little bit more of these characters in this season, but unfortunately their involvement was very minimal. And of course, Pablo realizes his destiny and meets his uncle in the dreamscape where he is christened El Brujo Especial. Basically, he is the sorcerer and magic expert of the group, providing the ghost beaters with a better understanding of the book and the weird things that manifest from it. And overall, Pablo was just more confident and badass. It was just beautiful and inspiring to see how much this character grew. This Brujo Especial, bitch. This was the season when Ruby really stepped up her evil bitchitude. Not only did she create another evil Ash, but she killed Brandy's mom, forced Ash to kill an evil duplicate of his own dad, demonically possessed Pablo, framed Ash for murdering a bunch of kids, and her most shocking crime this season was that she actually killed Kelly. I was blown away when this happened, especially since I was still feeling the buzz of watching the best fight scene in the entire series. Like everyone else, I was expecting this scene to transpire between Ruby and Ash, and I was a bit disappointed that it took place between her and Ruby for about five seconds. Believe me, I got over it quick, because Dana DiLorenzo and Lucy Lawless did such a great job during this fight scene that they put Freddy and Jason to shame. This battle was brutal. B.R. Oodle. <laughs> So yeah, Ruby wins, Kelly dies, and Ruby puts the soul of her friend Kaya into Kelly. Um, yeah. Don't really know what the fuck was the purpose of Kaya. She possesses Kelly, does little to nothing, and then is killed by the Dark Ones. I assume they just needed to give Ruby someone to talk to, but outside of that, Kaya was just worthless. I wish that instead Kelly would have been possessed by Ball. That way, it would have at least been a character that we know and like. Plus, it would have been very interesting to see Dana DiLorenzo play the character. But they went with this instead, so what can you do? Anywho, let's see. It's getting close to the end of the season. Check. Ash has lost one of his friends. Check. So I guess it's once again time for Ash to make a shit decision to get his friend back. Well, this shitty decision is a double feature. First, he gets Pablo to open a portal to the Deadite dimension, where everyone's soul goes when they are possessed by a Deadite. But here's the kicker. To go there, Ash has to die. Now that is a fucking hero. Unfortunately, with the Deadite dimension left open, the Dark Ones escape, and all hell literally breaks loose. Deadites run amok on the streets, the Dark Ones swallow Ruby's soul. Yup, after all these years, we actually got to see the Evil Dead swallow someone's soul. I'll 
swallow this. And of course, the Dark Ones unleash Kandar, the Destroyer, the prophesized demon that is supposed to bring forth the end of humanity. Thus, we arrive at our finale, the Medal of Man. While this was not the ideal ending for the series, it was not a bad ending. We got to see our hero kick a whole mess of Deadite ass and realize his destiny. Well, first he has a panic attack, which is understandable. After all, he's being asked to defeat the biggest demon ever. This leads to some of the most heartwarming moments in the series, as Ash basically falls apart, and Bruce's performance is excellent. Savior my ass! I'm a, a goddamn failure. But in the end, Ash knows that he's the only one that even has a shot at stopping Kandar. So after 30 years of being a careless jackass, Ash finally proves himself as a legitimate hero. And I'm not gonna lie guys, this scene made me cry. Evil Dead made me cry. Add that to the list of sentences that I never thought that I would say. Kelly, the people are gonna need a strong leader. Someone they can depend on. Someone they can believe in. That's you. Pablo, you're the jefe now. So Ash miraculously defeats Kandar by the seat of his pants and nearly dies. Or did he? In one of the most epic epilogues in history, Ash wakes up in a secret facility belonging to the Knights of Samaria, where he has been healing for an undisclosed amount of time. The world is now an apocalyptic wasteland being ravaged by the Dark Ones, and humanity is in desperate need of a boomstick badass in a blue indestructible shirt. How do you feel, sire? While I would have loved for the show to have gone on for at least one more season and see what this mashup between the Evil Dead and Mad Max would have been like, I do like the idea that Ash is still out there fighting Deadites, righting wrongs, and getting himself some sugar, baby. So hail to the king, baby. Final verdict. Thus, in April of 2018, the news was official. Soon thereafter, Bruce made his announcement that he was officially retired as Ash Williams. Was I disappointed? Sure. But to be perfectly honest, I waited 22 years for a continuation of The Evil Dead. I would have been happy with just one movie, let alone an entire TV series. Yes, the TV show was cancelled. But by that time, we had 30 episodes of Ash vs. Evil Dead. That's 29 more episodes that I thought this show would have. So while I wish that this show would have gone on longer, I still feel that it had one hell of a run. And the cast and crew of Ash vs. Evil Dead has nothing to be ashamed of. As a filmmaker and content creator, I feel extremely proud of Bruce, Rob, and Sam for going back to their roots and revisiting the franchise that started their careers, only this time applying all the experience they have garnered throughout the years to give it the quality that all of their loyal fans deserve. These men could work on any multi-million dollar project they want, but they chose to go back to the franchise that got them started, and for that, I am eternally grateful. A lot of folks criticize the show for not being as polished or as tactful as other more popular TV series, but those are the exact same reasons why I love it. The creators never concerned themselves with following modern TV tropes. Their goal was simply to create a faithful follow-up to the movies that we love, and ultimately, they succeeded. 10 points in the bad attitude meter! Reload your boomstick, refuel your chainsaw, and give it a watch. Groovy. Hey yo, this video is old. If you want to see brand new episodes of the Blockbuster Buster, go to dailymotion.com slash Blockbuster Buster. And if you want to join the Legion of Badassitude, hit that subscribe slash follow button. And join the Legion, suckers! Nice!